Welcome everyone. Nice that you are here. Welcome to our first in-person Angular Zurich meetup in like two and a half years because of obvious reasons, right? So we are all, I think, aware of what happened or is maybe still happening, hopefully not. And in that time, we had uh, quite some very important Angular releases, which is version 13, which we'll discuss a little bit, and then version 14. And both of those versions brought quite some impactful things for us, which will have that impact on the future of the Angular development. So let's explore that. So first, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Thomas Trajan. I'm a Google developer expert for Angular and web technologies, uh, working as a consultant with Swiss Enterprises, helping them being successful with Angular. Besides that, I am like a workshop trainer for Angular, NGRX, RxJS, writing blog, speaking at events like this or conferences. So yeah, before COVID, even international speaker, then no, not so much anymore. <laughs> like everything went like online, so like remote conferences, remote meetups, but hopefully this is gonna come back. Besides that, also workshops, Angular, RxJS, and GRX. So if you need some um, support for your team or organization, do not hesitate to get in touch. In terms of blogging, like over the last six years, the blogs are almost at 4 million views. So a lot of people, I think, found it valuable and found there a lot of interesting content where they could learn about the Angular, RxJS, and all these kind of topics. So feel free to check it out. If you are writing blog posts yourself and you are writing them by any chance on Medium, then you might be interested in this Medium Enhanced Stats Chrome extension, which I wrote, which gives you this total overview. And we have a new blog now with my colleague Kevin. So there will be like new upcoming content about the Angular, also about the topics which we are going to present today. So you might be interested in subscribing to getting notified about this new blog post. We will see that link even later in the end. Besides that, if you are just by any chance only starting with Angular, like as an author of popular open source repository, called Angular NGRX Material Starter. You can check it out to get an idea how to solve some common things like how to implement animations on route transitions, how to use NGRX to manage state, how to use translations, how to use teams. So it can be interesting. And if you are working in a large enterprise organization and you need to split your code bases into multiple totally isolated parts, then maybe you have thought about using Angular elements, which represent like this own isolated deployment unit. And if you use that, then you kind of need to be able to lazy load them. And for that reason, I created this library called Angular Extension Elements. Already has like 31,000 downloads per month. So people, I think, find it useful. So you maybe find it useful too. So, but welcome back. We are back in like uh, in-person events. So that's definitely great. And I'm hoping that now we will like uh, resume our tradition of like bi-monthly at least meetup. So if any of you is like a fan of Angular and you work with it on daily basis and you maybe figure out something cool like, like some very in-depth problem or just some very specific and you would like to talk about and share with like the Angular community, then do not hesitate to ping us at angularzurich.dev where you can get in touch with us and propose like your talk and then you will stand up here and tell everyone all of us about what you figured out. So that can be like a very nice opportunity to get into these kind of things. But now, very quickly, I would like to ask you, so first of all, how many of you are using Angular in day-to-day -day development in your job? Okay, looks like a correct audience, perfect. <laughs> how many of you already migrated to Angular 14 in at least one of your projects? Okay, so a couple of people, so that's cool that many people didn't yet, so we will have something new to tell you. And then for people who already did, I'm curious about like your opinion on some of those changes, like we can discuss it at the end. Perfect. So Angular 14, the best release in a long time. I think this is like a very uh, proper description for what happened, and we will explore why this makes sense. So first of all, released on the 2nd of June 2022, so already a couple of months. And it is the first release since the removal of view engine, rendering engine of Angular in version 13. So as we mentioned in the beginning, that it's, uh, uh, that this uh, 13 was also very impactful. So if you are aware, Angular has this thing called view engine, which basically updates the view whenever you make changes in your state. 
And then there was this huge rewrite happening in the background from version 8 till version 13, where they completely reworked that rendering engine, and now we have Ivy. And this was basically the main time sink for the Angular team, so they had to focus all their efforts to make that happen. And now, because this is finally done, the view engine was removed, and we are in this Ivy-only world from Angular 13, the team was able to finally focus on delivering actual real features for us developers to make our lives easier. So the my Ivy migration is completed, and this unlocked the future evolution of Angular. So Angular can focus on Angular team can focus on delivering new features, and one of those features, which was requested for a very very long time, basically since the inception of Angular in 2016, is that we finally have properly fully typed reactive forms. So let's see what that means. So there was this long-standing issue open in 2016 where people were asking for it because, I mean, like the main point of Angular is that everything is fully typed. I mean, Angular was one of the first front-end frameworks who fully embraced the TypeScript, and now like all the others are kind of following the trend with the Vue 3 and also the React with uh, Create React app like this uh, when you generate the workspace and stuff like that. So Angular was the pioneer framework who brought this. But then there was this weird mismatch where, OK, we are like uh, TypeScript first, and we have everything fully typed. But then if you want to do forms, like it's not typed at all, like it didn't really make sense, right? So now this is done. There is a automatic migration. So when you use ng-update, we will see how it's done. It will basically take care of that migration. So now we have full, uh, fully typed safe forms without any custom workarounds. In the past, it was possible to achieve this with some custom builders around it. But now we don't have to do any of that. So how does it look like? Let's say we have like a defined uh, reactive form with the form groups. And now as we see, if we try to access this, we get the perfect code completion support from our editor. So we do dot, it knows what kind of properties are there based on how the form was defined with those form groups, based on how they were nested. So this was previously type unsafe. So if you made a typo, then you were updated the state which is not in your form, or you were getting undefined instead of your value. So this is no longer the case. It is impossible to do it wrong, which is really amazing. So let's say we have a project in Angular 13, and we want to migrate to Angular 14, and we know that now Angular supports fully type safe reactive forms. So we had code like this in Angular 13, and then we run ng update. It will update the packages. It will run the transformation behind the scenes, which is exactly this thing which makes it work out of the box. And the result which we are going to get is that it will replace all those previous form types and interfaces like form group or form array or form control with the untyped form group, untyped form array, untyped form builder. That way, it is fully backwards compatible, so you can run and compile your application just as before. But if your application was done properly, that you had no type errors in the like currently in the version 13, then basically what you can do is to just run search and replace for this untyped prefix, remove it, try to build it again. And if it builds, now you have types and forms without extreme discipline on your side, because now the compiler will help you to keep it that way without like just checking everything 10 times or writing some strange unit tests. So this is really nice. So let's say we ran this search and replace. So now we are back in like this typed world. So we remove that untyped prefix. So now we are using the form group or form builder, which are typed. And uh, now as we can see, we have this form. It has a username. It has email. And here we try to patch value, and we use value wrong. And now, because those interfaces are typed, uh, we will get a proper type error. We would get that in the console when we are trying to build the project, but we also get it in the, in the editor itself based on what kind of editor we are using. So I guess like, like proper engineering, then we have like IDEA or VS Code. So probably there is like a Angular language service and the TypeScript service, so we will get a proper hints about that being wrong in our editor. So this is pretty amazing. So we adjust the import. We basically revert them back. So there was the migration to make it fully backwards compatible. So we preserve the untyped behavior. Then 
we revert that migration and hopefully if we have it properly, if we had it properly typed, then it will just work. Else we are going to discover some bugs which we had in our application and which we didn't know about. So basically great stuff. So fully backwards compatible as we have seen, automated migration to un untyped prefix on the original interface. Incremental migration is possible where you only slowly start typing forms one by one by removing those prefixes. So you can migrate at your own pace and find errors which might have been lurking in your code bases. And if you had it properly, you can just migrate to the typed forms with one go with a simple search and replace on your whole source code, right? So cool. Another great feature is native custom page title. So what does that mean? Uh, it's a native support for page titles. So you know when we have application and we navigate to various routes, usually we want to reflect the currently active route or currently active page into the, the tab title, right? So when we have multiple tabs open, even maybe from the same application, we know we are at the customer's page, we are at the admin page and stuff like that. And this was possible to do previously with the title service, but it needed like a lot of custom implementation. So now this was streamlined and the base use case is covered with a single property, as we will see very shortly. And of course, if you need to do something like a translation in Switzerland, right, at least three or four languages, then you still can define standardized title strategy, which will take care of that. So how does that look like? In the past, when we defined the route, and we wanted to do a title, we usually had to uh, store this kind of data in a custom property which was not handled by Angular at all. So we just named that property title in this generic data object and then we would retrieve it from the activated route and maybe use a title service to reflect it into the title. Now what is possible is to just specify the title property directly and Angular will automatically reflect it into the browser tab title without any need for any kind of custom integration. But of course, if we wanted something more complex, which is like, let's say, translated title, if it's not just like the company name, but it's like, a, I don't know, it's a user, and then for German would be Benutzer or something like this, we can define a custom title strategy, which will retrieve that title from the currently activated route, and then probably will not be the title itself, but like a translation key, then we can translate it and set it there. So very nice stuff. Again, standardization, instead of doing custom hacky workarounds, everybody did it slightly differently. And I mean like the best thing about the Angular is that we have this one approach that every project kind of looks the same. So it's easy to switch from one to another project, especially in large organizations, right? So this is a cool thing. Now we have a new way of doing dependency injection. So anybody notice this here, the inject. So that was like a cheeky little if somebody would notice, but I know it was very fast. So usually when we wanted to inject like a title, which is a service provided by Angular, we would have to do a constructor based injection, right? So now in Angular 14, it is possible to do something like this which leads to a new way of doing dependency injection in Angular. So what is it? It actually started as a bug fix which exposed this internal inject function which was there since a very long time. And it turns out people really like it. Like there is so much going on like in the community and on the Twitter and on the blog posts, people try to figure out how to improve developer experience and reuse boilerplate in the implementation by using this inject function. So it has a I would say like it's not the best thing just to start using it all over your project. I think like the best place to use it would be in the libraries to even reduce the boilerplate needed to use those libraries even further. So for example, for NGRX and stuff like that. But yeah, we will see. Maybe there are some use cases which might make sense also in your own application code but I would just not now go through the whole application and migrate like from constructor to inject. That doesn't bring anything. So uh, there is a gotcha, which that, that function only works in some con circumstances and not in the others. And that circumstance is called injection context or constructor time. So what do we mean? If we have such a code, I hope you can see it. Here we see we have a component and this is like a simple 
small example how we can reuse maybe boilerplate in the future when instead of injecting store and doing store dot select selector we can have like a centrally defined utility which injects the store behind the scenes so we can just directly select something from the NGRX selector like as a property assignment so it's bit less code so again for the third party library and this will work because the property definition on the class level happens in the constructor time. Same if we do it directly in a constructor, this is going to work because whatever runs in a constructor is in a constructor time. But if we try to do it in ng on init, maybe because we need to parameterize it with the value from the input, this would not work because ng on init runs later during the runtime when the template is available. So that's like a gotcha, for example. All right, then we have protected properties. So maybe you are aware that whenever we wanted to use something in the Angular component template, be it a property or a method, it would have to be declared as a public, which in TypeScript means either writing public or not writing anything, because the default access modifier in Angular is public. But this was not really nice because sometimes you have like a real public API if you get a reference to your component with like a view children, for example, and then the, that reference or that consumer component would see those properties on those other methods which were not supposed to be public. So now it is possible to use protected keywords, same as in Java or in C Sharp or wherever, where now it will be possible to access properties and methods on the component which are protected in the component template. And hence, we can differentiate between the real public API and what is just meant to be consumed in a template. So this is something really nice when you are implementing your own custom component framework for your organization, for example. So how does that look like? Let's say we have a popover component. And here we see we have this protected property. And now I can use it in a template. This was not possible before Angular 14. And still, we have a public method toggle. Because if we don't specify any modifier, it means it's public. And now, if we, let's say, in, like get a reference to that component in another component, for example, with the help of the view child, and we want to call that toggle method, and we try to do like the code completion, we see only the toggle method is now exposed as a public API, but we do not see that protected property. So we can prevent that somebody reassigns it or something like that, which is great. All right, other new features. So there was improvement to the language service. So that's basically hints that editor provides you while you are writing your Angular code, especially with regards to like this banana in the box syntax and the optional chaining. NG model, which is for template driven forms, finally works which in components which have on put change detection, which was actually broken for a very long time. There were Angular C like uh, improvements. You can run ng completion, which will basically give you code completion for the Angular CLI commands in your terminal. So that's also very nice because there are quite some new options. And now we have finally ng cache. So ng cache is like um, allows you to control caching behavior. So Angular introduced caching behavior to speed up the build, but then sometimes when you wanted to debug library in the node modules directly without linking and stuff like this, you would have to manually delete that folder over and over. And now you can just, for a debugging session, for example, disable the cache. So you can just do ng-cache disable. So this is very useful for these kind of scenarios when you want to debug library directly in the node module of the consumer application. And Angular DevTools are now available in Firefox, so if you are uh, people who like to use Firefox, now you can benefit from that. Then there are three shakeable error messages. So for example, previously, like when you had an error message, it was a long string and it was in your production bundle. Now they have error codes. So then for the production bundle, the whole message is stripped. There is only error code, which you can easily Google and get the whole message. So your production applications are even a bit smaller. So this is pretty cool. There is ability to provide injector for embedded views, that's when you are doing lazy loading of the components instead of whole routes. It was not possible to override injector with different services. Now it is. 
And there are some new Angular CDK primitives, which are basically headless versions of the menu and the dialog. Again, very useful in a context if you are writing a custom component library for your organization. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel to implement this kind of behavior. You can just use those headless ones and get it. Some additional methods for harnesses and experimental support for ES build, which should be even faster than the standard one. I tried it. Many things do not work, for example, internationalization and other things. So it's still in alpha, but just like you know, it's coming. So the builds are supposed to be even faster in the future. So for the people who already migrated, migrated to Angular 14, did we forget something really big? What is that? What kind of components? That you can not use the modules. Standalone components. That's correct. Or in other words, optional ng modules. So this is a big one, and we don't really have capacity because this is just a news, right? But we will just give like a very quick intro, and then maybe in a month or two we will come back with like a more in-depth uh, look at this topic. But yes, it's true. Angular now work, or the Angular team now works in a, on a way to write applications without needing to write ng modules, only components. So it's called optional ng modules or standalone components. So first of all, don't worry, this is not a new huge breaking change in Angular. We will see why. It's just another way to achieve the same, and there are some reasons for that. So first of all, application now can be bootstrapped without defining application module, just using bootstrap application and a root component. So in our case, that would be like application component. Uh, it allows for less boilerplate for the people who were already implementing their Angular application using a scam, which is perfect, like a <laughs> perfect abbreviation, like a scam, <laughs> single component Angular module. So some people like to implement their Angular application in a way where they basically literally define a companion module for every single of their component. And now they don't have to, right? So then you just can skip that module and the component standalone. So if you already have been for any reason using this pattern in your project, it will get better. But the main goal is actually to make Angular easier to learn, to make the learning curve simpler for the beginners, which is really true. Like if you want to learn Angular and you don't have like a lot of pre-existing engineering knowledge, it can be pretty hard to wrap your head around about all the concepts, like we have TypeScript, we have build processes, we have dependency injection, we have template contexts, we have so many things. So, and for that it makes sense. So I think like the main reasoning behind this is to be able to bring people in the Angular ecosystem without scaring them off like, ah, oh, you have to understand this and this and this, and just give them like this path into it where they can start very simply, but of course, those concepts which were handled by the modules, they are still there. They are just hidden temporarily. And once their application or complexity or skill grows, they can revisit those concepts and have a deeper dive. So basically, it's an alternative syntax or syntactic sugar to define template context and injector hierarchy, which are basically two main underlying concepts behind Angular modules. That's their purpose. So what does that mean? The new standalone components manage the template context by taking over the responsibilities like declarations and imports of the ng modules. So you might be aware if you have a module, you have some components in that module. If you want to use another component in the template of that first component, they need to be part of that single module template context. So it either is in the declarations array or it's imported in the imports. And then we have uh, providers, which sometimes we used on the lazy loaded modules to only scope it to that lazy route. And now we can do it instead of on module, we can do it on the route itself. So now, like a small tiny example. So the smallest possible Angular Hello World got even smaller. So here you can see we import component, put some template, say standalone true. We don't even need the selector if we use the correct one in the index HTML. And then we bootstrap application and we have a running Angular application. So as you can see, like really for the tutorials and beginners, it doesn't get simpler than like this. So then the argument of the React or Vue community kind of falls flat because now we can do it too. It's like, bravo. 
Uh, and then here is like a more advanced example where we see it's a standalone component which manages what modules used to manage. So it manages the list of imports of other standalone components and existing engine modules. So as you can see, there is backwards compatibility and interoperability. All right. And then we can see, oop, we can define a provider directly on the route instead of on like the module which was lazy loaded. Okay, so it's great for learning, great for small project. Over time, maybe it will lead to some improvements to developer experience for also enterprise great projects. And it's just another way of doing the same. And the template context and the injection hierarchy are here to stay. They did not change at all. They were just hidden temporarily for the beginner use case. So yeah, we are also working on a new block about that, very in-depth comparison. So then we will share that later at the end probably for the time reason, so you can go to the website, subscribe, and you will get notified when we release new blog posts. And um, yeah, what's your favorite feature from this list, what you've seen? What do you think you will use, to, not tomorrow, but maybe in a week? Standalone components we have? For, forms. Exactly, right? So whatever you do, like the type forms, it's something which everybody can get like very quick benefits from, I would say. So that's probably like also my, my top choice. All right, so and then we are already done. It's just like, if any of you works in a large enterprise poly repo environment, then come later and talk to me because I have created a tool which helps you to manage it in much better way called Omniboard, helps you to get an overview of such environment, track changes, migrations, and stuff like that, uh, pretty useful. Like, let's talk later because of the time reasons. And if you like Angular, like working with Angular, and you would like to get some more hands-on support, then check out angularexperts.io, Angular services for enterprises, workshops, consulting services, architecture review, monorepos, starter templates, custom icon libraries, bundle site analysis, whatever you need, we have you covered. Perfect, so thank you for your attention and always bet on Angular. <laughs>